All right, everyone. Hello and welcome. Dean, if you could just fast forward to the next slide today. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for joining us today. We're going to be discussing this is you're you're in for a treat. Uh, I always love presenting with Dean Peters, but seriously, this is going to be uh, a great, great webcast. Uh, we will be discussing the evolution of AI in hardware and manufacturing. Uh, so as always with our webinars, uh, I'll kick it off with a few intros and then a few housekeeping items, and then Dean's going to take it away for the main uh, part of the webinar. Uh, Dean, could you fast forward, please? Yep. And hi, Clint. Welcome. All right. So uh, hi, everyone. My name is Rena Alexin. I'm the CEO of Product Side. I'm calling in from sunny Miami, Florida. Uh, I've been running the company now for almost, can't, can't believe it, but almost six years uh, and uh, been just absolutely having a great time, especially over the last year where we've really invested a lot in trying to understand how AI is changing the game uh, for products and for product management. Uh, and Dean, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Dean Peters. I'm located right side out, right outside of Raleigh, North Carolina, very hot Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, in the little township of Apex, peak of good living. We know it's true. It says so on all four of our water towers. Um, I've been with Product Side for about two years, two weeks, and four hours. Uh, but who's counting? And just love teaching the classes and coaching and talking on products like this. Uh, probably bringing in a little bit of the AI experience I has, 20 years as a product manager and 10 years of recovering from the coding I did before that. Great. Well, for those of you who are not familiar with product side, we are an outcome driven product partner. The reason why our clients love to choose us is that we come with a whole solution uh, built on the product side blueprint and our playbook. So we help companies really adopt the best practices in product management. And we tailor all of our trainings and our engagements to their context uh, so that we can maximize adoption of these new practices. And every one of our engagements is led by an invested expert like Dean here. First, I wanna go over, uh, like I said, a few housekeeping items. The first one is that this webinar is really for you all. Uh, we can, we want to take your questions throughout the webcast. So anytime you have a question, please, please, please ask it. Uh, we will have time for Q&A at the end of the session, uh, but I will even bring up your questions live uh, if it's relevant to the content we're presenting. And now I'll answer the question we'll get most commonly, which is, can I watch this later? And the answer is yes. Uh, we will be posting this webinar uh, to the website and you will also receive an email uh, with the recording after we end. For those of you who are looking for a product management community, we encourage you and welcome you to join our LinkedIn group. Our LinkedIn group has over 50,000 product professionals, and it's a great place to share best practices, post things and ideas that you are thinking about, ask questions, and network with your peers. There's a link in the chat, and there's a QR code here if you'd like to join our LinkedIn group. And now, Dean, over to you for our webinar. Sure. Thanks so much, Rena, and, and awesome. Uh... Appreciate the introduction here. So today we're going to talk about AI and manufacturing. It always starts with understanding the problem. As you know, our mantra here is stay calm and focus on the problem space. Um, we're going to talk about insights from other industries. So we're going to learn from other areas of manufacturing and hardware on how they've made their digital and AI plays. We're going to talk about the transition we've seen over the years from digital lagging to digital leading, which then helps us move ourselves into what's currently happening, where organizations are figuring out, where do I make a winning AI play? Uh, finally, we're gonna have some takeaways and next steps, and hopefully some great questions and answers. But I think first we need to 
take a poll. Whoops, let's get that out of the way here. I got something bleeding over. All right, so I think we got some poll questions. Jerry, can you launch the poll, please? There you go. All right, so what are your current plans for AI and manufacturing? Uh, are you going full steam ahead? Are you just getting there? You're still figuring things out and working through the problem. Uh, <laughs> do you want us to send help? Uh, or are you window shopping or completely trying to avoid it? Please answer the question um, with the poll. Oh, we're getting results. Right. <clears throat> We're getting window shopping and send help. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, not surprised. Nobody has responded avoiding like the plague or full throttle. And that's, I think where a majority of people currently are, they're trying to figure it out. Um, or they're, you know, just looking to see what the actual opportunity is. All righty. Yeah. Awesome poll. Yep. Yeah. All righty. So like any good product management uh, uh, webinar here, we want to start with the story. We're going to start with what I call the switch makers dilemma. Now I've been teaching digital product management and AI product management here at product side, been hearing some interesting feedback when I talk to some of our partners in manufacturing. Um, specifically, what I'm hearing is something along the lines of, I'm a product manager for a circuit breaker. I don't know how to do digital or I can't do digital. Um, I hear someone say like, hey, I'm working on a drone for agriculture. I have no clue how to digitally transform that. Uh, <laughs> and then of course, what I'm hearing is if I can't figure out how to make it digital, if I can't figure out how to transform it digitally, how in the heck do you expect me to make an AI play? And so that's the story we've been hearing all for quite a bit now. And my response to that is, okay, all right, it's cool. I want you to take a journey with me from taking your switch. Let's say it's your electrical switch. Let's say it's your circuit breaker. How do we go from a switch to a smart grid? How do we take you down that journey where right now you are in manual control? You have this physical item. How do we get it into a state of digitally monitored where you're, you have sensors on the device? and where you're picking up lagging indicators. How do you take it to that next step of predictive maintenance where you're staying ahead of the failures and you now you're, you're working where you have those that proactive telemetry in place? And then finally, how do we get you to AI enhanced where your device, even though it's a switch, even though it's a circuit breaker, it's, a, it has, it's autonomous, it's smart, and it lets you make great decisions. And so, so Dean, the question, yeah, go ahead. Dean, uh, just kind of going into this, what really is the difference here between the predictive maintenance and the AI enhanced? Like what is different? Yeah, so I think part of the difference here is that where the, the you know, the proactive telemetry is, it's, you know, it's using AI, it's, it's looking at data, it's making prediction here. What we're talking is the next step with AI is how do we elevate and augment the experience of that product in a larger context? You know, a switch or a circuit breaker or even a, a, an agricultural drone doesn't live isolated in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is part of a larger ecosystem. It's part of a larger, a larger you know, it's part of a larger subsystem or super system. And so how does how do we allow that switch to provide uh, information or work in, in, in a way with AI that helps you run that entire system with a greater experience, uh, whether that's going to be you know, improving the entire work stream or whether that's going to be in individual tasks. How do we take that little switch and then use AI to augment the entire ecosystem with it being a, a player within that ecosystem? Great, thank you. No, all right. So, and that's the question I ask. How might we evolve our physical product? Again, I've been teaching classes where people say, I don't know how to do this. And I say, well, you don't have to look far. You just have to look at a little bit of history, okay? You know, for example, if you look at upstream oil and gas, right around 
between 1950, when we first started talking about artificial intelligence, and 1970, when we were just starting disco dancing, we were looking at a lot of manual drilling and then evolving to SCADA. So SCADA is where they slap sensors on a lot of these well systems here. And they were using it for basically you know, precision of, of the allocation. You then started seeing between the 70s and 80s. So they gave you a lot of lagging information. You saw the same thing with toy manufacturing. Uh, you saw a lot of things being brought in for the mass production of efficiency. So we were going from handcrafted tools to factory made tools here. And so there was a certain amount of, of digital brought into that process here. We saw the same things for mechanical switch gear. By the way, mechanical switch gear is just a fancy name for your circuit breakers and switches. <clears throat> and so we started seeing digital switch gear right around the 70s where they started putting sensors on things. Then we started seeing through history in around the 90s, early nascent versions of IoT coming about here or electronic integration or remote monitoring. Um, and, and that was going to help with those type of situations where we're looking to run the, the workflow a little more efficiently. Now we start seeing around 2010 things, you start seeing the trend towards AI. So one of the first AI trends in up, upstream oil and gas was pump by prediction, where it's how do we, how do we do a uh, pump by exception, excuse me, how do we use all these sensors that we have all over the place to send that one field tech out to the right place at the right time. Uh, interactive play started showing up on our, our consoles during the 90s and the between 90s and 2010. And we have, of course, predictive maintenance showing up. Now we're looking at pump by prediction. So more product predictive analytics showing up in the oil fields here where it's basically using tons and tons of data collected over the previous decades and saying, I think you're going to have a problem here over on well field number five. Uh, personalized learning for to toys. So we're taking toys and based on you, you could have, I had two other siblings. Wouldn't it have been great if we had to share a toy, but it knew who each of us was and gave us those personalized learning experiences there. And then you also have autonomous operation starting to show up with some of these circuit breakers and switches. So again, we're, 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 we're taking things and moving them into the larger ecosystem here. So you can see that we can take some lessons from history. So let's say you're working on that agricultural drone. Let's say you're working on that little light switch. Let's say you're working on a water bottle for your bicycle, right? How do we go ahead and move that into a digital experience here? So as you remember, I was talking about that first phase in the timeline here. How do we go from manual to digital we were adding sensors to the device itself. And so you see this happening a lot, like I said, in upstream oil and gas and some other places where they take the actual device and they just go ahead and tack on a sensor. Now, before that happened, they actually had to send someone out, uh, you know, uh, into the field. Well, basically, they called it a field operator. And there's this person in a pickup truck going on dusty roads and having to read dials and meters and write it down on a grease board. And then having to take the grease board back to have it, you know, somewhere, uh, you know, what they call written somewhere else. So they started putting sensors in the field here to capture things like the torque, the pressure, the fluid levels here. And they got more precise measurement of the flow. And one of the reasons they needed to do that, because part of that was for billing and part of that was for maintenance cycles. Um, and what was interestingly enough, while they had advanced with uh, uh, sensors, they still made that poor field operator go out to the field and have to actually do a download of the data. So they'd go out with a laptop, they'd go out with a fob. Sometimes they, they actually got a little ticker tape, you know, of that, and they'd still have to collect it. So for whatever reasons, they still wanted that field, what they call field operator to go out to the field. But again, they were no longer having to read dials. They no longer had to climb up to the top. You know, you know like imagine having to make this climb up here just to read a, a, a meter. You know, you look at this, this rig here. No, you're going to read the rig down here where it's a little safer. Okay, so again, some some improvements there. Um, we go from that to what I call digital leading. So now we're getting in the, into that, you know, observability play. Now we're getting into that play where we're doing some predictive or uh, proactive telemetry. And what they did is instead of putting the sensors on the device alone, 
Now that you extend that and put the sensor on the device's housing. So for example, this is a, a, a has a set of bearings in it. You really can't put the sensor on the bearing, but you can put it on the housing. For some of those D light switches there, or those circuit breakers you may have in your home, all right? You may not have, be able to put sensors on those, but you can put sensors on the panel in which it's sitting. In fact, a lot of the, you'll see like a company like ABB selling these circuit breakers and switches and building the intelligence into the panel into which it goes. And that is where you can derive a lot of information here. Um, and in fact, you, you see where you add the device to the housing instead, you go ahead and communicate the data either directly to the cloud or to what they call an edge device. So edge computing, you know, just imagine a small computer, maybe a, a fanless computer somewhere in the, echo, in the larger system there, uh, location, whether it's in a factory floor, and then it's aggregating data and then it's pushing that out to the cloud. Now this gave manufacturers a broader view and we're and a, and a chance to start thinking about, hey, we could probably start selling the digital products as well. So the question remains, how can we make an AI play if we've made these digital plays? You know, Dean, we've already added the sensors to the equipment to optimize its value. Dean, we've already added IoT all over the place here. What's left? I mean, you know, crunch more data and equipment here. Um, and and I think that's a fair question. Rena, that's to your question. Okay, what is the difference between going from digital leading into AI? And so here's your question again. And what I want us to think about is the augmented product experience. There's an AI opportunity if we can get our heads out of the benefits, especially those of us like myself uh, who came from a technical background. We a lot of time think about the core benefits of the product. We think about the technology here. <laughs> if we're a little more nuanced, a little savvy, we do start thinking about the features and the style and the packaging. But a lot of us don't look at the augmented experience. And it's in this area with the standards, installation, services, warranties, finance, a customer care, decision-making, deliver, all these things that we can start thinking about where AI can play, where we can extend an AI play to something as simple as a circuit breaker or a switch, or you know, a toy car, if you want. And so again, it, it, we need to consider the entire product, uh, focusing on enhancing the entire customer experience there. Uh, personalizing the interactions around AI, uh, making AI better for decision uh, uh, making. I had that situation at Seven Lakes where a lot of us, you know, they were doing a lot of work focusing right around this area for pump by exception. Again, what's going wrong with the well? Who do we send out? And what type of you know, equipment do we need to send them out there with? And by the way, are there dead snakes and you know, are there rattlesnakes and dead cows out there they need to worry about? Um, when I got there, I said, yeah, but if we think about the extended part of this, can we start getting into pump by prediction? Can we get ourselves in a situation by looking at data here in the larger experience and not just on individual pieces of equipment where I could say, look, we have an entire system that's starting to turn a little bit sideways here. You could pay, you know, you could get a person out there now and have them spend a half day, or you need to send an entire crew out there with replacement parts two weeks later, pick your poison. I think, Rena, you have some examples yeah. of, of some other companies like, like that? Yeah, uh, Dean, exactly right. And by the way, we hear this a lot with uh, the manufacturing product managers we work with, where a lot of what they have um, to think about when they're building their product is, okay, this needs to last for 30 years. I have to think a lot about the hardware component. Um, how do I actually make a digital play here? And one of our clients uh, was in a situation where um, after doing some discovery around the augmented product, uh, found an opportunity to, to put in some proactive sensors. Uh, so they had sensors already in their data uh, center, but what they did was identified a way for them to pro predictively understand when a chiller in this data center was going to go offline. And the impact there, because they were they were thinking they needed to solve a data problem around, well, how do I get redundancy for data? But instead, they created 
extreme value for their business because they could predict when a chiller would overheat. And by doing that, solved a much bigger problem that covered uh, even like considerations of safety. Um, sending repair people, having the chillers be offline, and then also replacing a million dollar chiller. All yeah. of that went away when they figured out how do they predictively understand when something was going to happen versus mm -hmm. fix the problem after it happened. Right. And you're talking about now a network of sensors. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about a network of sensors working for a particular problem. You're saying, hey, we're 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 going to look at the entire experience here. We're looking at the basically the warranty and services aspect of this. Mm. You know, what is the life cycle here? Do we, you know, we know what this unit is already. And we know, and so again, it's taking that switch, or in your case, those those individual sensor touch points here, and then saying, all right, well, how do we look at it in a more holistic picture? And that's where your AI plays are going to start happening. So along with putting sensors right on it, do you know, to look at control or to manage you know, the flow, along with putting sensors on it to go ahead and doing a little bit of predictive, all right, how do we go ahead and look at the entire experience here when people are interacting? Or how do we for example, let's say we want to make some, exploit the bottlenecks. You know, we've read the book Gold Rats: The Flow, and now we're all hopped up on on looking at the bottlenecks here. And how do we go ahead and start building around the bottlenecks there? How do we not have to worry about a bunch of uh, what would you call it? Different data of I'll say data of different of data of varying unstructures, and quickly get it structured to a point where we can make a recommender system to the people in the field there or to the dispatcher who has to send people out there. So again, there's AI plays to be had that augment the experiences for maintenance or augment the experience for you know better operations. It could be that you're running, uh, uh, like I said, you have that switch sitting in a bank that's running circuits for the HVAC unit in a, let's say in a, an assisted living center here. How do I make that assisted living center more safe? Can I build a recommender on top of that by looking at that and other uh, aspects of the extended product experience there? And, so, and Dean, I just want to make one quick point here because I think a lot of people that I've talked to where they're sitting on the fence or they're they're in that window shopping um, category uh, of what, what to do about AI is uh, not feeling confident that they can effectively understand AI enough to bring it into their work. And yeah. here is exactly the point where it's really very basic product management skills around discovery and being curious about the whole product. Uh, these are things that any product manager can do, and they can work with, with people in engineering and development and uh, data science to figure out what the solutions could look like. But the critical product management skills around discovery and, and, and being curious right. are, are still here. I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I just did a, uh, um, I spoke at a triagile a few or at a product camp uh, just about a month ago. And I said, how do you bring an AI experience around the toasted bread experience? And it was the same conversation I was trying to lead. And sure enough, you know, all the engineers raised their hands and said, well, we add five gadgets to our toaster. I'm like, well, you could do that, but now you're taking this simple act of pushing a lever down and turning it into work. Uh, and so again, we are we started talking about it. How do we look at the extended experience here? Uh, the community of practice here. Are there other people within my community? Are there other people where there's some best practices we can look at and share? So again, you need to look past just the sensor. You need to look past just the, the, uh, uh, the, you know, the cloud reporting, the, you know, the sensors on either the direct sensors or the indirect sensors. We need to start looking at not just the units, but the environment in which the unit sits and the people and ecosystem and impacts there. Because, you know, look at what Peloton did with a digital play, all right? They brought the gym experience. You can't put a sensor on the gym experience, yet they managed to bring the gym experience into a, a, an AI-enhanced experience here by bringing the community experience uh, you know, you know into, into everyone's living room with a bit of an AI and digitized play. So let's say we decide we figure out what that problem is, what that area of the extended user experience is or the extended product experience is. 
how do I go ahead then and figure out what direction I take with AI? Now, one of the things we teach in our class is the fact that, well, again, keep calm, focus on the problem space. And why don't we learn from other winning AI plays and playing fields? Why don't we go ahead and understand, hey, what are we trying to do with whatever play we're trying to make? Let's say we're trying to make recommendations to a dispatcher, all right? So it's more than just saying you've got a problem in field number three. Now we're trying to actually help this dispatcher make a decision based off of that what that little switch was telling the entire ecosystem. So are we trying to cut costs or reduce risks for systems? Or are we trying to make things easier for humans? And within that, are we trying to make it as an, a tactical play on a task or a strategic play on a workflow? Are we trying to automate something that's risky and tedious? Again, something that may be out of reach, something that may require a, a feat of, you know, of humankind that we really don't want to put humans through anymore. Or are we trying to optimize an entire work stream, such as a factory floor operation, such as, you know, getting you know, getting a chan uh, uh, what do you call it, products through the entire channel system here? Or are we trying to make things easier for humans, like trying to reduce the level of effort they have to do on a piece of work or help them improve, make you know, make more, uh, more intelligent uh, decisions based on what that little switch was telling the ecosystem. And again, it's not that hard because what you do is you just start with the problem. If you decide you want to make things easier for the humans, then you just say, hey, I want to make jobs cost less or easier or I want to improve decision-making. And then we can start looking at some winning plays. Do I want a chatbot-like experience? Do I want an adaptive personalization? Do I want to generate content? Or do I want to run simulations and support strategic choices? Because once you've made these plays, you identify them, it doesn't take you long to find existing companies that are what I would call analogous or adjacent companies who have made a similar play that you could learn from like, oh, wait a minute, Duolingo is doing something with a, uh, with a, a what do you call it, personalization here. Um, you know, when it, with the simulations, ABB is running this thing called Octopus for maritime shipping. You might be doing, working on some sort of traffic flow. My point being is, <clears throat> and with something I tell my classes, look at adjacent or analogous plays. But how are you gonna look at them if you don't break it down first? You know, you wind up boiling the ocean. So let's just take a small part of that ocean. Let's say you're trying to cut costs and risks and you're going after automation. So do we wanna automate the quality checks? And then we go, look, it doesn't, you know, you don't have to go far to say, hey, find me some AI plays on, on quality checks. And they may not be exactly what domain you're in or industry you're in, but they may be close enough that you could learn something valuable on how you're going to innovate uh, in your solution there. I don't know, Rena, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, I think this goes back to just being open and understanding the problem you're trying to work on first, because what a lot of people get stuck on is how do I know what solution to offer? And that's the wrong question. I think that's what we're trying yeah. to explain here. And that this applies very much to something that is in our physical world, because the physical world has now become so connected, it may as well be digital. Right, right. So, so again, it, it's a matter of, of, again, figuring out what problem you're trying to solve, and then breaking it down into the, the playing fields and plays here. Um, and I think, now, like I said, Dean, yeah. Yeah. I, I do have a question here because you've now taught, um, you know, di digital product management and AI product management um, to a variety of, of people working on physical products. Uh, yeah. Do you find that, uh, because I kind of mentioned it earlier, that there is, when you're working on a physical pro product, you tend to work uh, in a more of a waterfall fashion because you have to, you know, there's a very different yeah. Um, amount of risk involved in making a, you know, you can't really iterate as as quickly, uh, obviously, as a, in a digital play. Yeah. Uh, and so are you finding that, uh, you know, in terms of the the skill area or the experience required to do this well, um, do, is there anything that, that you do, you say to encourage people working on physical products? Like what should they learn or try to practice right. in order to uh, do this well? 
So there, there's a few things here that are, are of interest here. Again, don't just think within your own industry. All right. Mm -hmm. If you're working on a switch, there may be something analogous to that. If you're working on toys, there may be something that's similar to that or within the same playing field. The other thing is start looking and seeing what companies are doing. For example, there's a whole host of consultants out in the world now who are work who used to work at SpaceX who are working on the problem of agile for manufacturing, where they understand that, okay, you've got lead times with materials that you have to deal with that could create problems here. You don't you can't necessarily test the same way you would in software, but you can test. Um, I've heard of some amazing things being done with simulations that are very, very uh, uh, helpful in in understanding how the product works. Uh, they're so much better than they were just a few years ago. Um, there's people who are doing 3D printing as far as like, hey, we'll just knock off a quick prototype here just to get a feel. They're using 3D printing. I've heard of the use of breadboards for people in elect electronics as they're trying to work out particular things here. So there's different ways of testing the individual parts of the whole to see if that works. Uh, so there is that. And, and again, part of that is you don't find that out unless you start looking around at different industries for inspiration. So other, have, other manufacturers, other people building hardware. Have you seen what manufacturers do in terms of changing their process internally to, in order to help implement AI plays? So I, you know, I, like, I, I saw a lot of it when I was working at, um, in, you know, an upstream oil and gas with, with seven lakes, I was watching the industry itself start thinking about like, okay, how do we start working you know, again? How do we start working smarter instead of harder? How do we, uh, I knew that there was people already working on problems like, all right, we're we're working with all this machinery. We're trying to, you know, uh, manufacture this product here that requires these different steps here. And so along with just being a sensor play, they were doing a changing a lot of the ways they work. They weren't trying to boil the whole ocean by creating this big monolithic system out the gate. Um, they did work more modular. They did work in more of a plug and play type of situation here. Uh, I know of one company right now that's working on the, the problem of hydrogen for industrial. And they're actually trying to build it with, I think it was like, forget how many megawatts that it services, but they're trying to build it in a way that's modular. So you don't have to buy the whole unit or build the whole unit. You actually can have several units working in a parallel sense here. Um, and so again, they're not trying to boil the ocean by trying to make you know the mother of all of all hydrogen rectifiers here. They're working at it on on smaller slice uh, smaller slices of functionality that they can then serialize together or run a plug and play. I'm seeing that happening with music synthesizers, where they've gone back to very modular units. You just sort of yank them out and yank them into the you know into this large uh, panel here. And it's just a matter of, okay, if I want a particular type of effect here with this hardware, I don't have to sit there and buy this whole big panel or keyboard. I can now just sort of, you know, bring things in together in parallel or in series in a way where I can create the effect I want. Yeah. Uh, well, I what, what I've seen in terms of some product managers, I would say having challenges um, in more of a traditional manufacturing type environment is particularly around uh, process of funding and, yep. and financing. Um, that I, I'm hopeful, right? It, it's very company dependent. I am hopeful that more and more companies are going to change because they must change. But a, a lot of these companies, they have very, very onerous, like six to nine months planning cycles. Uh, and it's really sometimes difficult for uh, product managers who are trying to operate much faster um, you know, in, in yeah. smaller, smaller well, increments. We, mm -hmm. well, we, we, I ran into that when we were working on the NHANES project where we actually made, we took these four, we were recording the nation's health. And so basically what they did is they took these, you would take four large trucks, like these trucks that they would use for, uh, uh, I don't know, for, for when they do road shows with, uh, um, football games or whatever. And they retrofitted them with a bunch of medical equipment. And my job, of course, was to make sure all the medical equipment worked and played well together. And what we were actually doing is building these medical exam units by hodgepodging these different units together here. And again, we would have never built it if we hadn't been testing things individually first. So for example, I had to take this spirometer, spirometry device there 
And, you know, when you blow into that and take the readings there. So I had to figure out a way of testing that both individually, but then proxying away how it would work in the larger medical unit itself. Uh, so as we're putting in that solution, and then I had to bring in the phlebotomy device for blood and other bodily specimens. Apparently, I was the lucky engineer that got to integrate all those. Um, again, you working on those in, in a modular fashion, even back then, helped us get past some of that. Um, yeah, culture is an interesting thing. I think we were successful with that. Uh, we were successful for the first bio, uh, biometric identification system at airports at CDSI because we basically carved out skunk works. So sometimes you actually have to take, you know, part, even though you're part of a larger company, they shipped us off into the, you know, into a building, into a nearby industrial park and said, okay, you got six months, you know, tell us what happens after that. Um, so sometimes even if the culture is against you, they, they actually uh, would just picked us up and separated, separated us from the mothership and had us work in a more startup type fashion. Yeah. And what I like about this framework, Dean, and that's why I'm bringing it up, is that uh, by un understanding exactly what you're trying to automate or make easier here, it also makes you very much more of an outcome focused product manager. And yeah. so you're able to then articulate, I, I think e it's easier for you to articulate what the business value of what you're trying to accomplish is. And that is the business value is what really speaks to a lot yeah. of these kinds of executives. Uh, uh, yeah. Well. Yeah. I would agree with you. And you can burn through these experiments pretty fast individually. Mm -hmm. So in other words, let's say we're trying to improve decision making. You can burn through the simulate and say, hey, is simulations what's going to create such customer delight that it's going to nourish our business model? You you know, by by not trying to just boil the whole ocean or taking the engineer path, like, hey, well, we'll just go ahead and bring it. You know, I knew a group here that was just like, oh, well. The argument they were having was, well, should we use uh, OpenAI or Lambda? You know, and they come to me and I was, this is out of meetup. And I said, well, first of all, what's the problem you're trying to solve? And they're sort of waving me off. I said, well, hold on. I said, you know, are you trying to help people with decisions? Or are you trying to you know, get them individual jobs done? They hadn't answered that question. Mm -hmm. As a result, they built in a bunch of complexity into their system. And that's going to be true in software or hardware. You know, so again, you could burn through a simulation test pretty fast. You could burn through generate content very fast here on its own. What you can't do is run these rapid value, you know, validation experiments if you try boiling the whole ocean. Well said, well said. All righty. So do we have any questions so far? I'm no monitoring. Questions. I don't see any open. Uh, feel free, everyone, to use Q and A or just enter your questions in the chat, and we'll take them at the end. Yep. I so start thinking. Yeah, start thinking of your questions. So we told you what we heard. We heard people telling us, Dean, I don't even know how to make my product digital, let alone how to make it predictive. So how in the world am I going to make it? You know, play work and play well with AI. So again, start your journey. Think of what, you know, what does your journey look like from manual to digital to AI? And the reason why we're saying manual, manual to digital AI is when you think about it, AI is nothing more than an extension of the digital transformation play here. So what we're just suggesting is think about your digital transformation as you work your way to your AI transformation. Learn from historical case studies to help guide you. You may be able to leap straight into AI and say like, you know, forget about the other transformations, we're gonna make the jump. But then look at industries that made that jump. For example, automotive industry made that jump. You know, they came up with uh, predictive and what do you call it, robotics in the in the 60s. And I was reading about it, I was like, wait, they had robotics in the, you know, for auto, you know, for manufacturers, you know, on the, on the factory in the 60s, and they just leapfrogged all the way over to AI. So there are instances you can learn from that. Um, Move beyond, if you've got sensors everywhere, move from your lagging indicators to your predictive because that's your first step. That's sort of the, uh, you know, the, the crawl before you walk. And then when you want to do a sprint, think about the entire product experience. And what I mean the entire product, not just the product itself, not just the switch itself, but the switch. What hosts the switch? Where that, where that panel is at? What that panel is trying to do? What that panel is, you know, who are the humans involved on that factory floor or in that that power you know, uh, distribution unit there or in that with working with those rectifiers here? 
Think about that larger picture. And in that larger product picture, you are going to find some of your AI plays. Um, once you've done that, pick your play and pick your playing field you want to explore first. Burn through it with experimentation here. You can do that very quickly. And then if, if that's, that's a winning play, that's fine. If not, burn through another. Great. Uh, well, Dean, we have a, a question here from Tim. Uh, and okay. he's asking, how do you make the AI additions cost effective in a hardware product? Yeah, um, <laughs> I think that's that. So, oh, there we go. I, was, I had the question. I, I did not answer it. So sorry for hitting the answer button there. Um, how do you make AI additions cost effective? A lot of that has to do with what AI play you're making and how you're trying to make it. I think there's going to be a lot of surprise here how, how quickly people are burning through some money on the AI itself. Um, I think one of the first questions that comes to my mind is, are we going to build, borrow, or buy? All right. And, uh, and, you know, because a lot of times we decide we're going, you know, one of the ways we incur a lot of costs on the AI play is when we try to build it ourselves. So the first thing I might do is say, can I do a borrow or a play before I do a buy? Um, I know of an individual who's thinking about an AI play, and she went ahead and just First of all, just sort of sketched it and did sort of a thumbnail sketch, as, as it were, just using chat GPT, just enough to show some proof of life. Um, and then was able to go ahead and expand there. I worked with a company that was working in upstream oil and gas who decided to build things on their own, and it was very expensive. And I had to remind that organization, that's not the business. We're not in the analytics business, or we're not in the business of building foundational models here. So part of that is the choice of, all right, how do we, how are we going to, uh, uh, you know, work more economically there? Some of the part of that is how much do these different transactions cost? For example, if you're making a generative AI play, do you know what you're costing in tokens? Do you know what it costs for 300 users or 300 instances or 300 pieces of equipment? Do you know what it costs for 30,000? You know, what's going to happen when you scale? Um, we're talking to Corey Bryan here in the Raleigh area. He, 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 ought, he challenges his product teams with that all the time. What would it look like at a scale 300? What would it look like at a scale 30,000? And what would it look like at a scale 300,000? What we call a good problem to have. And so part of that is understanding your scale. And then part of that is also understanding your external factors. You know, do we... You know, there's some things we don't control. We're not going to control our channel partners. We're not going to, you know, uh, have a lot of control over our cost of goods uh, in, a, in, a, in a large fashion here. So some of it gets down to that. Can we use AI to help us perhaps manage that? I would think so. I think there's AI plays in manufacturing to, to help us like, hey, let's say I'm manufacturing beer and I have a recipe that takes a certain types of hops and that hops becomes unavailable. Um, can I use AI to make recommendations on different types of hops and where I might find them so I can still get out my seasonal brew in time for Thanksgiving, right? So again, there are AI plays we can make to save us costs at various points along the way. And some of it is just collecting information where the failures are or where the where the where we're spending a lot of time or energy on things. And I'm, I'm not just talking about time or energy and the effort. Literally, how much energy is being consumed uh, on some of these things? Um, what is the time? How much inventory are we going to hold? So there's all different places we can we can pull all different levers. And that's what I, I think gets to our conversation we had earlier. Think of the holistic product here. What are all the parameters? What are some of the political and economic factors outside of our industry and product? that are going to sit there and impact us. That's why we teach like, hey, you might want to examine the Pestel framework because there are factors outside of our boundaries that could impact the cost and operation of our product. Tim, let me know if I got your answer for you there. I think I, I tried to hit all the bases there. Yeah, uh, Dean, I've also heard a, a lot of people say AI is not always the answer. <laughs> so yeah. that's, that's the other thing is it yeah. doesn't need to be AI. You know, it's a yeah. strange game, and sometimes the best way to win is not to play. You know, for those of you who know what movie reference that is, you know, who are as old as dirt as I am, you know, thank you for playing. Um, but yeah, good. Glad, glad we could help you answer that question there, Tim. Any other questions we could answer? 
Yeah. Uh, I have a few uh, here, but uh, why don't we launch our next poll? Okay. Sounds and like a plan. Uh, folks who are l listening and joining in, if you do have any questions, again, use Q&A and the chat. Uh, but I have a few here, uh, discussion topics that kind of we, we had talked about. Uh, Dean, I am curious uh, in terms of what you're seeing. Uh, I think we talked a little bit about process, but uh, what are you seeing in uh, manufacturing uh, companies who are successfully moving from digital to AI? What are some of the practices that they are yeah. doing? I think the first thing is they are understanding the need for it to move to a decentralized digital culture. All right. So in other words, a lot of manufacturers, you know, since they came from manufacturing, where where tenets are, are adherence to Taylorism, where everything sort of sort of came top down. There a lot of these manufacturers are starting to realize no, we we too are going to need to work as teams of great decision makers. Um, and part of that then is, all right, how do we move towards a more digital culture here? And not just digital transformation, but a digital cult, digital minded culture. They know that, you know, we're going to keep selling switches. But if we don't start getting in the game where we're starting to use our data to, you know, to enhance our business model, that's not going to help us. So, they, so some of these manufacturers have created a great digital foundation. And, and on that, they're able to build a great AI play. Yeah. Uh, Dean, really quick, um, we just got the answers to the poll and it looked like an even split between predictive maintenance, quality assurance, and then a few people who are not actually manufacturing. Uh, but I guess they're probably in the window shopping category. Yeah. Uh, no problem. yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, time for one more question. And that is, uh, and this is one that I think Dean, you and I have talked about a, a little bit, uh, but specifically to manufacturing, what, where do you think the industry is going? What's the future of AI and manufacturing over the next five, 10 yeah, years? Yeah. I, I think there's going to be some impact on the future with autonomous agents. All right. I think when we start cutting these autonomous agents loose, they're going to start looking around at how to optimize a lot of these workflows, these larger holistics, you know, they'll look at a factory floor and find the optimizations much faster. Um, they're basically, when you think about a, 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 an autonomous agent, it is a factory within itself. I mean, it's a digital answer factory, but it's still a factory within itself. So I think, you know, as the AI starts building more AI, we're going to see some of those optimizations. And I know it sounds a little scary and dystopian, um, uh, but that's one of the things there. I do think, like I said, there's some other areas that we're going to start seeing uh, where, where, and it's not in areas we think about. I mean, when we think about the onboarding experience, when we think about that, that field tech, we're going to see organizations being able to uh, use AI to create much better uh, personalized content around what they're doing to the point where they're not going to worry that they have la language barriers between, you know, in the look at the per Permian Basin right around Texas there. You've got, you know, two, basically you've got people sp speaking three different languages. They, they're speaking English, they're speaking Tex Arcana, or they're speaking Spanish, okay? And so how do you create content, uh, you know, that's personalized for each of these persons for the problems they're at? We're going to see a lot of that happening with the AI as well. Um, I think in manufacturing itself, again, we're going to see probably um, more more in the area. Like I said, we're probably going to see some some real influence and just better sensors and just, like I said, better uh, uh, the ability. I mean, I've seen like little sensors right now that look like a Band-Aid. You know, just sort of like, you just put it like, you know, you just put it like, it's just like on your fingernail size. And so I think we're going to be able to collect data from anywhere and everywhere even more. And now that we can use tools like large language models or other types of tools to look at irregular data and make regular sense of them, we're going to start seeing people just grabbing data from all sorts of sources and not sweating the cost of cleaning and mopping it up as much. Yeah. I find that manufacturing, I mean, the manufacturing industry, I mean, that's been the hotbed of innovation since the start, right? Anything that could have been automated in the industrial revolution was quickly automated. And uh, I do see there's there's going to be a lot of application, I think, in the uh, across. And I like how you how do you said it in, in the auto like the augmented product also now. Uh, yeah. But uh, I I am so curious about some of the other innovations that are happening. That's not just the computer, but in terms of materials, uh, material science is very interesting, like oh, yeah. and things like that. So 
uh, I can imagine there's probably going to be a lot of uh, innovation and new applications in yeah, manufacturing. I, yeah, I, I think I think you know the ability to test a product in a simulation or even in a live setting with sensors here. I mean, you know, wind tunnels on steroids, as I'll put it here, where you'll be get moment to moment improvements on you know tensile strengths on on you know hydrodynamic dynamic flow. You're going to get inf so much information so quickly. That, that you are going to see some improvements. And you're right, we're going to see that augmented intelligence. I would imagine we're going to have some pretty smart plumbers out there who know the different, you know, who know how to handle when that mowing blows up, they know why they're bringing a Delta faucet into play. Yeah. Well, Dean and um, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Just one more slide. Uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, one of the topics that we talked about today was that to take advantage of AI, AI is a technology, what you can do is have really good, strong product management skills. And so I invite you all to check out our optimal product management course and our digital product management course. Um, and for everybody that's listening, we have a special coupon code uh, that's valid just this week uh, for $250 off any of our uh, online uh, products. Uh, again, thank you everyone for joining us. A huge thank you to Dean. Dean, it's always just so fascinating for me to hear you talk about your such varied experience. Uh, and I also love uh, just uh, kind of just understanding where the future is going to be headed because there's just so, so much change happening over the last oh, year. Yeah. And it's been yeah. so much faster too. So yes, for, the speed, yeah, the speed of which we're going to, like I said, is just going, is just, it's folks, it's going faster than you think. Yeah. And so that's why do not be. Uh, afraid of this, don't be alarmed, embrace it. It is definitely the future and there's just so much we could do. Um, so I'm, I'm just really, really optimistic and excited. Uh, all right. Well, thank you everyone. And join us again uh, in a few weeks. We're going to be talking OKRs.